Hey everybody, welcome back to The Fin Factor. I'm Paul. And I'm Aaron. And this is episode number 93. We already talked about it. There's only a 94. We're going to get to skip right past that. In this episode, we will be talking about uh, the draft that just happened, as well as some of the trades that happened. Yeah, we'll talk some of the free agency uh, stuff going around the league and what the Sharks are signing. And with that, we're going to have our special guest today, Shang Peng. Hey guys, what's up? What's up, How you buddy? Doing? All right. Well, uh, much like uh, the the highlights in the last episode, I think we'll just get on with it. <laughs> well, he's the editor in chief of San Jose Hockey Now. His work has also appeared at ABC News, Hockey News, and Vice Sports. Sheng Peng, welcome to the show. Hey guys, how's it going? Doing well. Can't complain. I mean, I could well, be, yeah. Not going to. <laughs> you can't complain about the first day of Sharks free agency? Oh, well, that'll <laughs> make you guys uh, one of the few fans out there. <laughs> yeah, everyone is upset in the first hour of free agency. <laughs> Doug Wilson they haven't done anything. Come on. <laughs> well, we'll certainly get to that. Uh, I think Aaron wanted to ask you uh, a couple questions about um, how you kind of got into working with uh, San Jose Hockey now. Aaron? Sure. Yeah, you used to be at Fear of the Fin for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where I first picked up on your articles, which I absolutely love. Uh, I love the very analytical and breakdown and use a lot of GIFs and stuff. And um, I think it was very insightful. And I really like, we are subscribers to your new website and we love it very much. Thank um, you. Pretty much reading it every day, especially right now. And there's a lot of stuff going on, which is exciting. Uh, so tell us a little bit about how you kind of got that started. Oh, yeah, sure. So, yeah, I was at Fear Defend for a couple of years, uh, covered the Sharks, went to every home game. I also went to every playoff game of the 2019 run. Uh, that was very exciting. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this uh, past summer, uh, Dan Kigurski, the editor, president of uh, National Hockey Now, asked me if I wanted to start my own website, my own uh, San Jose Sharks website. And so he put a lot of belief in me, and I thought, well, let's give it a shot and let's see what we can do in the middle of a summer where the Sharks aren't playing and they missed the playoffs and they're not going to play for nine months. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw that. He, I think you're going to be writing almost every day, I think, when you said oh. something every day. <laughs> yes. I like, wow. yes. I, I, yes. I remember those days when we first started the show. We started in, I believe it was uh, June, May, yeah. or May, the end of May. Um, and we we're like, man, we got to start putting stuff out there so people know who we are. And we were just coming up with just stupid stuff. Not to say yours was dumb, but <laughs> our, like, well, thank oh, you. <laughs> here's our here's our favorite list of Sharks players. Here's our favorite moments and all that kind of stuff. You know, just filler for the summer. It was it was a brutal summer. Yeah, and I was uh, counting on the season to start. Uh, originally, it was supposed to start in what mid December, and now they're going to keep pushing it back. And uh, I think January first is probably optimistic too. So we'll see. Yeah, didn't uh, the what's his name? Uh, the commissioner, geez, I'm blank. Gary Bettman, he came out and said January first is a start date before right. the draft, right? Uh, you... no, yeah, right before the draft, literally, yeah, the, the day of, yeah, he he, he said that, uh, and so hopefully uh, the country can can meet that uh, that goal, but uh, I'm not optimistic on that. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, a big deal is going to be Canada opening up their border to travel in between the two. Right. Country, essentially that's that's probably gonna be one of the bigger holdups i think um i don't think a bubble will work like they did for playoffs that's just not sustainable for for all of those guys because i mean i there was an article that came out on espn that um kind of interviewed i think it was four players there they stayed oh uh, yeah it's a really good one yeah yeah it, um it's i mean they called it a bubble confidential it was uh Rushinsky and emily kaplan so a terrific article yeah so you're absolutely right i if you're out there and you haven't read it, you should read it. And another reason why you should read it is because Gary Bettman came out uh, a couple of days later and said that that article was, you know, a travesty, you know, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and so if you're not a, a fan of, uh, of the commish, read that article, Bubble Confidential. That means it's true if he came out and said it was. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Bettman came out with a very lawyer-esque answer. <laughs> wow. All right. Well, uh, we mentioned the word draft a little bit earlier in there, so let's go ahead and run with that one. Sharks had nine draftees, all forwards. Uh, every other pick was a right wing. So uh, just kind of like your take on on that. And I know that the uh, when you look at the depth chart, look mm -hmm. at the uh, Sharks, the Barracuda, there's a humongous gap. When you look at cap, cap friendly, there's a humongous gap on uh, the right wing side. So 
Um, obviously, they're looking to address that need. Kind of your take on these players. Obviously, uh, Ozzy Weisblatt being the uh, first round pick for the Sharks. Seems like a really good story, but uh, is he a really good hockey player? Well, from everything I've heard, yes, uh, he is a very good hockey player. Uh, he may not be. I know a lot of uh, fans wanted him to take a shot at No Gundler, who uh, I think has a, probably a higher ceiling offensively. So you can say that Weisblatt is a safer player, but safer doesn't mean any less effective if they reach their potential. Sounds like Weisblatt can be a very solid middle six winger, you know, one of those guys you win with kind of guys that are really important. Um, from what I understand and from guys I trust, uh, not just – not just the guys like guys at Elite Prospects or McCain's Hockey. Uh, those are uh, draft guides that I leaned on a lot this year. And both those guys like San Jose's draft. But even uh, amateur people in other organizations, not the Sharks. Because, you know, if the Sharks are uh, blowing up their, their guys, well, they're supposed to, right? They're not going to tell you that, you know, so-and-so is, you know, terrible and you know, whatever, <laughs> right? So, but if it's other, other organizations, and I, I reached out to one amateur guy that I know, that I trust, in another organization. He said that uh, the first five Sharks picks he thought were spectacular. You know, it's very solid. And the last four, the seventh round, you know, the four seventh rounders they had, at that point it's a little bit more of a crapshoot. You know, he wasn't as familiar uh, with uh, the, the guys that the Sharks were going with uh, there in the seventh round, the four guys they picked in the seventh, which also tells you just how different these draft lists are too because, you know, Doug Wilson Jr. stated before the draft that the list, his, the Sharks list was 130 deep. He confirmed to me uh, in his presser, post-draft presser, that, that every player picked, even the four, seven, four seventh rounders, were on that list. And so then another amateur person that I talked to in that organization tells me that, you know, three of those four seventh rounders just weren't people he really knew. So that just tells you how draft lists differ uh, every team anyway. Yeah, it's yeah, interesting you, you brought that up because I actually had that quote written down. It was your question you had to Doug Wilson Jr. Jr. during that presser. And he said, we don't draft anyone off of our list, or we won't draft anyone off of our list. If they're not on our list, we will try and trade the picks to future years. And it's interesting because they had four seventh-round picks. They could right. have you know, probably traded two of them to get a six-round pick or somebody mm -hmm. higher, and they didn't do that. So, right. so they're trying to play the odds and, and getting four guys, and hopefully one of them will do something, you know? Yeah, and I think they figured, too, that those four guys that they were looking at in the seventh round weren't really on anybody else's list. And so that's why that they could trade. Because I think they got two seventh rounders for a fifth rounder, right? And mm -hmm. um, so at, at that point, I, I tweeted, too, it just made sense that they, the guys that they liked on their very deep 130-person list, and just for a comparison, uh, uh, Doug Jr. said that last year's list was 90 deep. So this, this year's list was way deeper. But I think that they kind of knew that the guys they liked would probably be there in the seventh round. And so why not take a couple of shots? Why, you know, spend one of these picks in the fifth round for a guy that's going to be there in the seventh? Yeah, yeah. pretty smart. That's uh, I actually wanted to ask about some of the guys that were taken in the top 100 because they, they took five players. Uh, in the top 100 and i like the way that they made it work and i was talking to aaron about this last uh, last show actually where i think the other gms in the league need to stop making trades with doug wilson because he seems to get the better end of it every time i thought it was amazing how he traded down from 34 to 38 picked up the the 100 and then right. traded the 100 and the 128 i think it was to move up to the 78 so he drops four positions for a player that he was probably going to get anyway and moves up 50 spots uh, for probably somebody in, in a deep draft still, but 50 positions in that draft is, is pretty drastic. Yeah. Yeah, well, let's uh, give credit all, credit also to Joe Will. Uh, Joe Will, according to uh, Doug Jr., handles most of the draft valuation stuff. And yeah. one of Doug Jr.'s jokes was that, you know, they've done this a couple of times, trading a fifth rounder for two sevenths. And I guess that's called the Joe Will special. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, also too, to to the point of of them, you know, trading uh, trading back. Uh, Doug Jr. mentioned that the very first day that he admired, and you know, was the the question uh, that I asked was, you know, I wasn't asking about what how other teams did, but he made uh, he went out of his way to mention that he liked what Calgary did on the first day, uh, dropping back twice in the first round, which is pretty unusual. Yeah, and then he turns around and basically does the same thing, not right. twice, but he, yeah. 
Well, really, it speaks really to awesome. also too, like the you know, it's a Bill Belichick football thing too, right? Just mm-hmm. basically try to take as many shots as possible. And it's not that you don't trade up to trade for your guy. The Sharks are well known for doing that too. They did that to draft Logan Couture a long time ago, just for example. Um, but and they did that. Uh, uh, they did that a couple days ago to or yesterday to draft the. Uh, uh, but geez, yeah, the, the time is <laughs> it, it's all combining two days ago. I'm sorry, uh, two <laughs> days ago uh, to uh, draft uh, Daniel Agustin. Uh, they moved back up to take him. Yeah, and if all the teams in the league, they're going to use four seventh-round picks, the Sharks probably the best bet of having one of those players go to the NHL. Um, the Sharks put out a little stat sheet on – the draft and their overall drafts. And since, was it 2003 through 2019, mm-hmm. uh, they have had more than 1,300 games played from the sixth and seventh round picks than the next place team, which is Toronto. Wow. So they've had okay. 4,300 games played from sixth and seventh round picks. Yeah, I actually didn't know that. that that's, that's, that's pretty cool. But the Sharks, you know, are known for, you know, talk, talking to people. And yes, the Shark system isn't great. And if you want to criticize some of their picks, definitely justified. But uh, the Sharks are, uh, you know, just based on people that I talked to, draft experts, uh, that sort of thing, uh, this past week, uh, the Sharks are thought of, you know, they're very good at developing their own players. They're very good at turning guys that uh, maybe uh, in other organizations wouldn't have NHL future and kind of uh, turning them into, you know, diamonds, you know, diamonds out of the rough, that sort of thing. Uh, guys like Melker Carlson, who, uh, of course, his Sharks career looks like it's it's over now, but he gave a, a good number of years. Uh, Jonas Donskoy, uh, Marcus Sorensen, just developing guys and supplementing uh, the core of Joe Thornton and Joe Pavelski and Vlasic and all that all these years. So, Shank, do you think that has a lot to do with uh, Roy Summer and his group and maybe the reason why Roy Summer has the longest tenure as an AHL uh, coach that he has and he hasn't moved into an NHL role. Is he better at just developing players? Is that his bread and butter? Uh, I, I think uh, that's got to be a part of it. Also, i got to give credit to Mike Ricci, who works with a lot of the young forwards, and Brian Marchman, who works with a lot of the young defensemen. And I think uh, Roy's quality, though, is Roy is consistent. But also, too, I found with Roy that Roy is fair. And I think that he does definitely command respect from the guys, uh, from the from the players around him, you know, like it's. I don't think it's usually too hard to figure out what Roy Sommer wants, and I think that is important for a young player to have kind of these uh, very uh, uh, these goals that that you can you can achieve, so that you understand. So. Okay, so if we're done talking about uh, draft, then we'll uh, go ahead and move on to the trades. Um, we saw a couple trades for the San Jose Sharks. Devin Dubnik. Uh, first of all, do you like the trade? And if you can maybe explain it to some of the fan base that doesn't quite understand why we went after him instead of going to maybe free agency or mm-hmm. uh, somebody else. Why Devin Dubnik and do you like the trade? Uh, well, okay. First of all, why Devin Dubnik? Uh, Devin Dubnik, uh, despite a very, very poor season this year, has a long history of being a, a durable and pretty dependable starter. And the Sharks were very clear from the – actually, even before uh, Doug Wilson talked about last week, what kind of goalie they're looking for. Think about the names that – have been attached uh, with the Sharks. Goaltender names have been attached with the Sharks uh, so far this offseason. Uh, Jake Allen, Darcy Kemper, Devin Dubnik. Um, I think uh, in the end to the day, the day of the Dubnik trade, Pierre Lebrun also mentioned uh, Jay, um, uh, Reimer and uh, what's, uh, what's uh, Brayden Holtby. So what do these uh, five goalies have in common? These are number one goalies or guys who have played 40, 50, 60 games in the NHL and have done it you know, well, have done it capably. So that eliminates a lot of guys already. So if you wonder why the Sharks didn't just bring back Aaron Dell, who did perform pretty well this season, you know, Aaron Dell has never proven to anybody really that he is a NHL starter, you know, and it's an NHL starter type. And you can argue, well, he never got the chance. And true, that, that's, that's, that, that's a fair argument. But the other the flip coin, the flip side of that argument is that, no one ever really saw the fit to give him a chance. And there are reasons why he was not given that chance either, given that kind of ball to run and play, uh, you know, 50, 60 games or whatever. So anyway, so oh, go ahead. I, say, I thought Aaron Dell had a couple opportunities to take the reins and he just, he wasn't consistent enough to keep it. That's what well, I, 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 you know, if you look at the, those kind of stretches, I mean, the argument is though that he didn't get a very long leash though, right? That yeah. if he had one bad game or, two bad games that that was his chance 
And, it, you know, it would be fair to say that Martin Jones has been given a lot more rope than Aaron Dell in the last two years, even though Martin Jones hasn't really necessarily outperformed Aaron Dell by any stretch and probably is underperformed compared to Aaron Dell. But I think that there's not the belief, though, that Aaron Dell is a starter, necessarily maybe has the stamina or, 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 or whatnot. I'm not really sure exactly, exactly why. I haven't really dug into uh, that part of it. Why, you know, why didn't they just go, go back with Dell? But anyway, so a guy like Dell is more of a true backup. So what, you know, how much is a true backup making, right, in, in the market? A true backup is making, uh, you know, Laurent Brossois of uh, Winnipeg just signed for one year, $1.5 million. Brian Elliott signed for the exact same thing. Henrik Lundqvist signed for the exact same thing with Washington. So this is your, this is your, uh, this is what a true backup is making, one point five million dollars. Okay. Now the Sharks are are lacking in cap space though, and they want a true starter. They don't want a backup. And now the next question you might ask is, well, why not Henrik Lundqvist? Why not a surefire Hall of Famer like Lundqvist? And actually, that's an article that I wrote about a month ago, and I actually wonder the same thing. But talking to some scouts, you know, very uh, very well informed NHL scouts, uh, they told me that they didn't think that Lundqvist was a starter anymore. He wasn't a guy to play 40, 50 games. He was a backup at this point, in their opinion. So okay, so now you have to eliminate a guy like Lundqvist, then okay, because they want a you know a 50, 60 game guy. So anyway, so going back to the original point of the goalies that they targeted, guys like Reimer and Jake Allen, etc. These guys are all. Uh, these are guys are all guys that make. Uh, I think Ryman makes the lowest at three point four million, and I think Kemper is at four point five million dollars. Okay, so that sort of gives you the idea of the price range they're looking at. And so then, if Minnesota is willing though to to eat half the salary, and so therefore uh, the Sharks are paying uh, two point one uh, two point one seven of of Dubnik's, uh, of Dubnik's cap then that starts to make a lot more sense that suddenly you, you've gotten a guy that uh, has been a uh, number one guy very, very recently. You believe, unlike a guy like Lundqvist, who, yes, was recently a starter, but you may not believe that he can do that anymore. Whereas Lundqvist, is, I'm sorry, Dubnik is, you know, five years younger. And so you believe that Dubnik can bounce back and do that, can be a, a starting capable guy. And so you're getting Dubnik at pretty close to a backup price. And so I think that that was a big factor in, in all of this. Uh, you know, Doug Wilson did talk, too, very clearly about acquisition costs. So what's the acquisition cost for Dubnik? Uh, Minnesota is eating half the salary, and Minnesota is kicking in a seventh-round pick, and you're just sending a fifth back. That's a pretty good acquisition cost. You know, Jake Allen, just by himself, uh, he, he got a third-round pick from Montreal. Uh, Darcy Kemper, uh, the assumption is that he, he would – you know, that didn't come to, to fruition, but most of the talk is that Arizona wanted a, a first round pick. Uh, I had heard from my own source that they actually started their ask at two first rounders. So that kind of gives you an idea of where their head was. You know, it doesn't mean they were going to get those two first rounders, but they probably assumed that they would get at least one of them. And I mean, maybe they didn't in the end. So that's why they're holding him. But either way, though, you know, it, that's an acquisition cost that's way beyond uh, what the Sharks wanted to spend. So you count acquisition costs, uh, salary cap. And the fact that they believe, you know, you may not believe it as a fan, and you, have, you may have good reason to not believe it because Dubnik, uh, and he did, of course, have a, a very serious family issue uh, this season, but you may, not be, you may not believe that Dubnik is still a starter. Fair enough. But the Sharks do, and not just Doug Wilson. All this goes through of getting the Bokov. And the Bokov, who does have a close relationship with Dubnik, has worked with Dubnik for a number of years, or at least uh, I don't know if they've worked together, but they definitely have a relationship over the last few years. Nabokov believes that Dubnik can still be a starter. And so now you have Dubnik and Jones, and Dubnik provides uh, definitely a, a more NHL kind of uh, ready and proven, NHL proven insurance, just in case Martin Jones uh, reverts back to what Martin Jones has been a lot of the last couple. Yeah, and, and I really like that you had said that it all goes through of getting to Baca because, first of all, that is true. And uh, also that, you know, a lot of people are going to say, you know, Doug, Doug Wilson, if they don't like the trade, oh, Doug Wilson made another batch or whatever. But this isn't necessarily a Doug Wilson move. This is something that he pulled the trigger on, but he's getting feedback from Evgeny Nabokov. So unless you're doubting Evgeny Nabokov, Shark fans, I think uh, we can go ahead and say this is a pretty good, uh, pretty good move here, pretty good pick. 
uh, in terms of the pickup and everything. So I, I don't know. I, I like it. I like that. Not only did we only have to give up a fifth uh, and we got back a seventh, they're paying half the salary. Uh, but those picks were in two years from now. So it's not like it was one of the picks from this deep draft. Right. So uh, really, for me, that whole acquisition, all good things. Uh, I want to move on to Ryan sure. Donato. So I want to ch- your opinion on uh, Ryan Donato, where he can realistic, realistically sorry, slot in with the San Jose Sharks this coming season. Well, the Sharks need, in my opinion, an entirely brand new third line, and so there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, they also do not have the sixth forward of their top six. They have five guys that they consider top six forwards, uh, Kator, Hurdle, uh, LeBanc. Uh, Kane and Meyer, but they're missing number six. And so that could be Donato, too. Donato does have the talent. But there is a little bit of, you know, before we get too excited, and I've spoken with scouts who really like Donato and think that Minnesota really understood on him. And I I think the consensus is that this is a guy with 20, 25 goal talent. There isn't really a disagreement on that. But there's also a reason why Minnesota is so low, too. They're not totally ridiculous. And so there's something about his game that they didn't like. And so speaking with some some other scouts, uh, they say that his game uh, lacks a little bit of compete. They're not sure if that's there, uh, if always the engagement and focus is there. And that matters when you're trying to build a winning team. You can kind of uh, lose your concentration when you're on a bad team and still pop in 20 goals and – uh, if the team is bad, no one minds as much. But if you're really trying to get back to the playoffs, um, then there are there is still that question mark with Ryan Donato. If he can be kind of that 200 foot guy that you can count on, and who can also you know pop in uh, 20 goals maybe. But in terms of a uh, buy low opportunity for the Sharks uh, to get him and his 1.9 uh, uh, cap hit next year for a third round pick, I think that that definitely is a uh, is a uh, terrific gamble that I, you know, that I really can't argue with. I think that uh, it's, uh, you can probably argue uh, uh, Dubnik a little bit more, but Donato, he's young. uh, He's got uh, legitimate scoring talent. And the things that he isn't so good at, the kind of the compete uh, factor, uh, kind of the defensive engagement, those are things that can be taught in many cases. Yeah, I'm sure some of the veterans on the Sharks are going to be able to, uh, to, bring him up to speed, kind of, if you will, some of the veterans that will be in that locker room to kind of get him this work ethic. Well, hopefully, but, you know, those same veterans uh, didn't really quite work out last year, too. And so, you know, you got to have the talent to begin with. And um, that's the one thing I'll say about Ryan Donato. Last year, the Sharks went with a lot of younger guys who, not to say that those guys aren't talented, but those guys were not ready for NHL, uh, NHL work, and it was pretty clear. Uh, Ryan Donato is an NHL-capable player. He just has some... Uh, games in his, uh, I'm sorry, flaws in his game that need to be tweaked. Very good. Okay, so I, I think uh, in general you would say the two trades that the Sharks made with Minnesota Wild um, wins potentially for the Sharks. Nothing that looks too bad then. Uh, I don't, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, again, the acquisition cost is low. Uh, the ceiling is, is high. Um, you know, I think Dubnik is obviously the most controversial one because there are advanced stats that show that he has not been, he's been below average for actually five years running. It just depends on how much you uh, trust those advanced stats. And again, this is one of those things where the Sharks are aware of these things. You know, they're, they're not running an organization with a BlackBerry and, uh, you know, IBM, IBM XT. You know, they are aware of these things. And so regardless of these advanced stats, um, you know, again, not to flip it too much, uh, Doug Wilson is still the final say on these things. But if getting Nabokov is a huge part of it. And so if Nabokov says no to the goalie, I'm sure the goalie's not coming here. And it doesn't mean that, that Nabokov is infallible either. You know, goalie coaches are wrong. You know, Johan Hedberg, who is a terrific goaltending coach, he couldn't quite get Martin Jones uh, going for the last couple of years. doesn't mean that Johan Hedberg doesn't know goalies. You know, Johan Hedberg's won, I believe, you know, uh, 200 games plus, or at least 100 plus games. So you know, mm. this 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 guy knows goaltending, but he couldn't get Jones uh, turn around either. So not to say that the block is, is infallible, but uh, this is uh, kind of a, a as you said, this is a joint decision. And if they like Dubnik and they've watched a lot of tape of, of him, then I think that there's a good reason to at least uh, let's see what happens. At least you know, obviously you know, let's not judge. This is not a, something to judge. Uh, three months away from the beginning of the season. 
this year's schedule kind of plays into having a 1A and 1B type situation because there's going to it's going to be very condensed. There's probably going to be a lot of back-to-backs. So I think the Sharks are going to have to have two very capable goalies. Um, I'm not sure who would play more in Dubnik or Jones. It's probably going to be a hot hand type situation. But I think Bugner's system is going to be a lot different than what we've seen the Sharks play in the last five years or so. Um, what do you think that system's going to look like? Is it going to be more defensive-minded first and kind of less scoring, so it's going to be tighter games rather than run and gun, kind of what they used to be? Uh, well, uh, first to go back to the 1A, uh, 1B goaltending thing. Actually, that fascinates me because different teams are taking different approaches with that. It makes a lot of sense that with a compressed schedule and probably more back-to-backs that you would want two starting caliber goalies. And so Montreal obviously has taken that, uh, that, uh, that path with, uh, you know, spending 14 million on two goalies, uh, Jake Allen and Carey Price. Uh, obviously the Sharks are kind of trying to do something like that, but spend a lot less money doing it with Martin Jones and Devin Dubnik. On the other hand though, you have teams like, Winnipeg, that's still going with Broussois. And so that's Hellebuck, Broussois. And Broussois is nobody's idea of a number one goaltender. And so I think different teams are taking different tacks. Uh, even St. Louis, who traded Allen away, they look like, and I don't know if this will actually come to fruition because the guy that they're talking about, Vili Husso, uh, doesn't have any significant NHL experience. So that's a huge chance to take. But, you know, if they do go with the Binnington and Husso, that, uh, that also trends toward, you know, a clear starter and a clear backup. So anyway, just that just kind of fascinates me, and so I'm curious to see which team will be right in the in the end. So anyway, on the other point about uh, how different the Sharks will look, it's really actually hard to say. You know, I I, I didn't really find them to be a running gun team under Pete really either, um, and so I, I I'm more curious than anything. Um, I actually do have uh, on on my site coming soon, and it's been delayed by. Uh, the draft and free agency. But I had a really extensive talk with Rocky Thompson a couple weeks ago and really got into a lot of things that, that I think he's going to try to do with the, the Sharks at defense that, you know, who he's running and also the power play and ways to increase the offense, but without sacrificing the defensive kind of responsibility. You know, I, I, I it's really, um, yeah, I really don't have a strong idea yet. I'll have to look back at some of the Booner tape, which I haven't done yet, I've, I've meant to do, um, in terms of uh, what are some of the things that they're going to try to do. Uh, and so, yeah, so I think that's still kind of a wait and see kind of thing. Yeah, that's kind of the, the feeling I got too when uh, listening to them talk about it, where uh, they're saying body position, stick position, these are things – that you know we can teach these guys to do a little bit better without really sacrificing the offense. So um, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing the changes in the system. Bob Bugner having his entire staff all to himself uh, and being able to handpick these guys and say this is the way we want to play. I love that uh, Bugner, Madden, and Rocky Thompson, all of them are team first type players. Uh, the, when they played the game and they bring that into the Sharks locker room and the Sharks style of play, I think it's going to be all good things. Uh, and I'm just kind of crossing my fingers. But we've talked about the draft. We've talked about trades. Let's hit free agency just a little bit here. So apart from the Nason signing today, uh, what what did you make about the general inaction uh, by the Sharks on day one? Because there's a lot of people who, you know, they, they've got that meme where the, there's like a something poking at the Sharks <laughs> logo saying, do something, <laughs> right? So people wanted a big splash, but uh, maybe not what the Sharks are looking to do. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I would guess it's going to be a little bit of wait and see, see if, if uh, some of these uh, better uh, forwards who are out there or better defensemen who are out there uh, may not get the offers they're looking for, so they may take a little bit less. The Sharks are still a little bit tight against the cap. They do have a little flexibility, but they don't have a ton. Um, and so if you're, say, uh, you know, they're not going to get Taylor Hall. They're not going to get Tyler Toffoli. You know, if getting the uh, uh, Dandenoff is going to be out of their range. Uh, guys below that on the on a different tier, uh, Craig Smith, uh, Mikhail Granlin. Uh, it might be possible to put together the money for them. There might be not enough space there. But uh, unless you've really identified that that's the guy that you want, then and I don't know if the Sharks have, um, then then I think the then it makes sense to kind of wait and see if there's you know kind of a you know a, I know if people hate to say here to hear this during free agency time, but you wait to see if there's any bargains that pop up, and they will, especially in this free agency. You know we saw with all the restricted free agents who weren't qualified, uh, and that added a 
unprecedented crop of young RFAs to to the pool. Guys like Duclair or Nick Cousins or Athanasiu. Guys all with warts in their game, by the way. You know, none of these guys are going to be your perfect solution. But they are guys that, you know, Doug did talk about this today. And I don't know if we should take exactly what he said at face value, but he talked about not wanting to give longer contracts to older players. You know, mm-hmm. what does he mean by long? You know, uh, as a three-year deal to Craig Smith, who's 31 long, you know, that might be considered long to him. Uh, it may not be, you know, because, of course, he's the same person who gave, you know, Brent Burns a you know, eight-year contract, you know. So, <laughs> so who knows what long means to him exactly, yeah. you know, exactly what he's talking about. But I think it's safe to say, though, that obviously the upper crop guys, the, uh, the higher, higher tier guys who are going to get seven-year deals, guys like Peter Angelo, Hall, like, don't think about it. Guys like Toffoli, you know, who might get five or something, like five years. Probably not, you know. Uh, so anyway, um, I think, though, that they are looking to add, and Doug basically confirmed this, that they're looking to add a veteran defenseman, bottom pairing guy, a guy that can add to the competition in camp for the number six D-man spot. You know, right now the Sharks have a lot of young, talented guys there. They have uh, Paznachuk. Uh, they have uh, Merkley, uh, down, you know, who probably isn't going to make an NHL debut you know, right out of camp, but he is a first round pick. You know, he's going to be in the mix. If he has advanced his game greatly over the off season, he's definitely, you know, going to be in the mix. And so anyway, uh, those are a couple guys that are right there, but uh, you don't want to just give the job to a rookie. You want, you want to put a, a you know, you're not going to get a, maybe a great defenseman, but you can, you know, try to get a decent defenseman uh, in that spot. Uh, one guy that I thought they might look at is a uh, Mark for uh, but he actually went to Nashville. Mm-hmm. and I reached out to a source, and the source told me that the Sharks didn't even reach out to him, which was a little bit surprising. I thought that that would be the kind of guy that they were looking for. Uh, last year, they signed uh, Dalton Prout for kind of that, that, that type of role, mm-hmm. where, you know, your 6'7", uh, uh, defenseman veteran type, and it didn't work out because uh, Dalton, unfortunately, had issues with concussions. Mm-hmm. Um, but another guy that uh, fans have suggested is uh, Zach Bogosian. Uh, who you know made a good account for himself uh, during the playoffs, uh, winning the Stanley Cup with 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 Tampa Bay. But that one, I uh, got to throw cold water on. Uh, Bogosian was uh, was waived in February, and he cleared waivers, and he was a free agent. And the Sharks at the time, February, you know, think about February. The Sharks, I think, had just lost Eric Carlson. Uh, this was you know not a great Sharks team, and they still didn't take a chance at him. And a source told me that it was a hard no with Bogosian, and so. Unless something has changed, and a lot has changed in the world in the last uh, eight months or so. <laughs> um, so, so something could have changed. But uh, based on that, that conversation, I would guess that Bogosian isn't what they're looking for either. And so anyway, that's something that I'm digging around on a bit. Uh, most of my coverage on Sharks free agents have been on their chief problem spot, which has been, uh, which is forwards. You know, I have profiles on San Jose Hockey Now talking to a bunch of different scouts, scouting reports from NHL, NHL scouts on like 25 different forwards, mm-hmm. uh, none, none who the Sharks signed today. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I got to do a little more digging on, on the defensive side of things. And so anyway, I'll, I'll come up with, with a little bit more on that soon. But anyway, they are looking for kind of a bottom pairing guy. I think it's clear that they do need forward help, even though Doug doesn't want to overinvest in somebody. Um, and I think that there should be a quality guys left over that they do not have to give, you know, too much term or uh, too much uh, per year to. Yeah. In terms of the defenseman, um, the, really the spot that's open is uh, the right defenseman spot, and that's behind Eric Carlson and Brent Burns. So you have to imagine um, whoever they're going to put in there is probably going to get, what, seven minutes a night maybe. So uh, it may make sense to just let uh, one of the guys that's, ready to go from the AHL, kind of sneak into that spot, even if they couldn't, uh, you know, buy a player, essentially. If they couldn't get anybody in free agency or if they couldn't make a trade to get somebody to fill that spot um, because that player is probably not going to get a whole lot of time anyway behind those two juggernauts. Uh, one of the questions, though, uh, I have for you. So the the top six forwards, that was one of the, the holes in the roster right now. And you just said, you know, they're not going to get this guy. They're not going to get this guy, naming like Tyler Toffoli, um, and uh, I think Craig was one of the other guy. So one of the ones, two things. One, uh, mm-hmm. which free agents do you think might be left over that could still fit into a top six role? Number one. Number two, um, Tyler Johnson was put on waivers today. The Sharks are the third worst team in the league. So there's a really good chance that they could claim Tyler Johnson. Is that a guy maybe that is on the radar? 
Uh, okay, yeah, first though, I do want to uh, uh, push back on the point about uh, having an AHL guy as your sixth defenseman. I think that's a really not the best idea. This is what the Sharks did last year at forward, just throw AHL guys there and hope that one of them would stick. Playing defense, I think, is probably more difficult than playing forward. So even if it's 10 minutes a night or something like that, those are going to be a, a disastrous 10 minutes a night to just give somebody who isn't ready. Now, I don't want to assume that Pazmichuk or Merkley isn't ready. If one of those guys is ready and they're good enough, then fantastic. But chances are, you know, with the way defensemen uh, develop in the league and also where Merkley's game was uh, this past season, uh, and we haven't seen Pazmichuk at all, uh, that I wouldn't count on that. So you, I think you'd still want to bring somebody in. You don't want to just give it to... You know, Nick DeSimone or Jake Middleton, uh, no, uh, no offense to those guys, but uh, those guys have not proven to be uh, uh, six, number six defensemen in the league, which is, you know, not, uh, not a number one defenseman. It's not playing 25 minutes a night, but it's still playing a good uh, 10, 12 minutes a night, and you need to play those minutes well or at least not kill your team. Uh, so in regards to Tyler Johnson, uh, definitely tempting, but his contract is, uh, what is it? I think it's four years, 20 million left. I got to double check that, yeah, but I think million. it's, and he's, he's 30. And so he's kind of in the class of, well, is four years too long for that guy? And it's, it's going to be tough. You know, I think, I think if you move around the money a little bit, um, I think four million about is is what they might be able to afford if they really want to splurge on a forward. Because they still got to fill out that spot. So like I said, the aforementioned six defensemen. Uh, let's say Middleton is your seventh defenseman, um, but you still got to you know you still got to pay you know pay these guys you know even the minimum that takes out from your cap. So anyway, so four million might be kind of their limit. Uh, got to be tempting with with Johnson. Uh, he's uh, he's a very good player, obviously, but. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and then uh, in, in regards to other forwards who are out there, I think that with the Sharks kind of cap crunch, they may not get a guy who is like a surefire top six guy. Again, guys like Evgeny uh, Dandanov, uh, Tyler Toffoli. You know, those, those guys are second-line players, you know, or first-line players, depending on the team, I guess. But, you know, those guys are, are probably going to make out of the Sharks range. But uh, what you might get is you might get a class of players who are third-line players but who can move up and not hurt you. Uh, guys like uh, Nemesnikov is a pretty good player in Colorado. won't cost as much. Uh, Nick Cousins, who is probably closer to a third-liner but is still a good, solid player um, that can do a lot for you besides uh, score goals. And so that might be the class of player that you're kind of waiting for and hoping uh, drops down to you. And so we'll see if that happens. But I think that's kind of more we're looking at. So guys that – who are clear third liners. They're definitely not fourth liners. And that's really important. So they're top nine forwards, middle six forwards, who can slide up uh, on occasion or more than occasion, you know, for, for a spell and, and more than hold their own. And so that's the kind of guy I think is probably more likely. That's, that's the kind of guy that they hope Ryan Donato is. Nice. Um, do you see any of the prospects, at least forwards, not defensemen, coming up from the AHL this year? Uh, who do you think would be the top maybe one or two guys that you could see sticking in the lineup this year? I think Noel Gregor did a, a, a very uh, did well for himself uh, last season. I think uh, Noel Gregor would have definitely have an inside chance at a spot this season. You know, he skates well, he plays inside, plays hard, has a pretty good shot. Um, he's a guy that probably tops out as a middle six forward, third line, third line, third line forward, a good third line forward. Um, Blickfeld would have gotten more chances if the season hadn't uh, hadn't gone on pause. Um, you know, I think he only got a couple games uh, up in the NHL, but he definitely would have received more. Uh, the Sharks were pretty happy with him. Um, and then you never know what's going to happen in this long off season. You know, guys like uh, Chemileski might take a step. You know, Chemileski had a nice season in the AHL. Even guys who kind of uh, did not uh, did not take the step forward that the Sharks hoped for uh, this year. Uh, guys like Gambrell, uh, he's a guy that does have talent, and maybe a few months is going to be the difference for him to become to really secure a spot in the top nine. Um, I don't know if there's anyone that I would bet uh, is going to be third line or above, or really, you know, they may be forced to put in there because the Sharks don't have the depth. But I don't know if they have any guy, any young player that I would say is guaranteed to be a top nine forward uh, this year, or I'm sorry, next year. But they do have a lot of guys that have promised. And, you know, this long offseason, a lot can happen. 
Do you think Jumbo and Marlowe are both going to come back, or do you think it might be one or none? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I think Marlowe will come back. I actually think Jumbo will probably come back too. I know that there was a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, rumors in terms of uh, – or speculation, uh, better to say, that like he might go to Vegas. And it makes some sense on some, you know, some kind of wavelength, obviously, because the bar is there and Jumbo wants to win a Stanley Cup. And it makes sense that Vegas is a great destination for that, to try to win a Stanley Cup. But the truth of the matter is, and we saw this at a trade deadline, you know, it's, it's a hard truth. But I'm not sure if any of the cup contending teams, like the true cup contending teams, you know, teams that you think like, like Dallas or Colorado, or Boston, or Vegas, you know, teams like that see uh, Thornton as that last piece anymore, you know, and time may have passed them by a little bit. And so if he wants to play, he may have to go somewhere that isn't as close to winning a Stanley Cup. And San Jose, you know, for all its flaws as a team, um, is a pretty good destination for him, obviously. Uh, you know, obviously he's, he's beloved here. You know, he has ruled the roost in the locker room, you know, no pun intended. And so I, I think I think that if nothing works out with these kind of top teams and uh, like the Vegas is, um, you know, Toronto is not quite a top team, but, you know, Toronto is a team that was rumored to be uh, attached with Thornton by Elliot Friedman earlier in the summer. But they signed Jason Spezza. You know, once you resign a Spezza, uh, that's kind of the same player, but younger, and at this point, better than Thornton. And so I, I don't know. So I think in the end, I, I think that Thornton may want, may have wanted, you know, and use it as a past tense, I don't know for sure. But, uh, you know, Thornton may want to go somewhere to win a Stanley Cup. Uh, but if those teams that are close don't want him, then, you know, where would you rather go? You know, like a tweener team like Florida or just go back to San Jose? So I kind of wonder um, if he would just sign in San Jose and then kind of see who's in a position to compete for a Stanley Cup and then kind of ask for the trade in the same situation that happened last season, right? So maybe just stay at home, be comfortable, play your games uh, like you normally do in a comfortable setting and then kind of see who's willing to take that on uh, after the fact. Because you know Doug Wilson would move him. Uh, it didn't happen this last season, but I'm sure he would uh, pull some strings to try to get him on a cup contending team. Yeah, no, absolutely. And so for that to happen, though, Thornton will have to be a little bit better mm. uh, next year up to the trade deadline than he was this year. Mm. And, you know, we could see at the deadline what happened, that Marlowe had multiple teams that wanted him, and Pittsburgh was willing to pony up a, a third-round pick and potentially a second if they had won the Stanley Cup for Marlowe. That's a lot for a 40-year-old winger. Uh, but that speaks to uh, how well Patrick played uh, during during the season, dur before the trade deadline, that is. And it also speaks to that uh, Jumbo's game had fallen off uh, quite a bit uh, from 2018-19. Shang, thank you for coming on the show. You have a new website that you just started maybe, what, a couple months ago. So let's uh, let's hear more about it from the man himself. Awesome. Uh, thank you, guys. Uh, thank you for having me on the show and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk about uh, my new website. Uh, my new website is San Jose Hockey now. It's uh, daily Sharks uh, uh, stuff, stuff that you won't find anywhere. Uh, even just today, the first day of free agency, uh, we broke uh, that Melker Carlson was leaving the Sharks. Uh, we broke that the Sharks uh, reached out to Michael Grapner. Uh, and uh, Michael Grapner, of course, uh, has said that he's going to wait till the – beginning of the next season before deciding where to play. But to know that the Sharks reach out to him, you know, you know that that's sort of the kind of player that they're looking for. You know, Michael Grabner was a buyout guy, a uh, buyout guy that, um, you know, has scored 20 goals, I believe, four times in his career, a uh, speedy penalty, penalty killer type. And he's a guy that, you know, can definitely outperform his contract. And if you sign him to, like, uh, as a bio guy, you know, might get a million, million and a half or whatever. So anyway, that gives you the idea that the Sharks are looking to improve their team, even though the only thing that they did on paper today was uh, re-sign Stefan Nason. And so anyway, those are a couple of things that just from today, uh, we'll keep pushing the free agency stuff and see, uh, try to figure out who the Sharks might sign as their extra defenseman. Uh, who they might sign at forward. Uh, you know, they definitely they definitely need a third line forward. Uh, and also, too, on the site, too, I've spoken with a number of angel scouts, uh, about uh, 25 different uh, free agent forwards, uh, guys who are kind of pie in the sky, like uh, Evgeny Daninov, guys who aren't necessarily coming, 
uh, but are also other guys too who might be more kind of in the Sharks price range and who may still have some upside. Uh, guys like uh, Nick Cousins, uh, Nemesnikov, uh, even a guy like Ilya Kovalchuk, who is, you know, not a lot of upside left, but who can probably still score and maybe help out uh, the San Jose Sharks. And so anyway, that's all on my website. And so give it, give it, give it a look. Well, Shang, you do amazing work. Uh, that's one of the reasons we wanted to have you on the show. So, uh, guys, if you are not subscribed to San Jose Hockey Now, uh, definitely go give them a look. It's worth the cost of admission. Shang, if people want to get a hold of you, reach out to you on Twitter. Do you have a Twitter handle? Yep, absolutely. It's uh, uh, at Shang underscore Peng and uh, at uh, S-H-E-N-G underscore P-E-N-G. There you go. Okay, guys, uh, make sure that you check it all out because he's one of the best hockey writers there is. Uh, like I said, broke some news today on things uh, like the Michael Gra I wish we knew about them. I haven't seen that article yet, so I'll have to go back oh. and read that. Um, <laughs> I, I, I actually uh, uh, I actually made it subscribers only first, and then oh. I, I unlocked it. So, so yeah. Very good. Okay, well, uh, subscribers only. So, guys, uh, hit that, uh, that dollar sign button, and uh, you'll be able to read some really, really good, great content from Shang Peng. Shang, again, thank you so much for joining us on the show today or tonight. Uh, we really do appreciate it. And uh, Aaron, do you have anything else you want to add there? No, it's just fantastic stuff. I really enjoy your, your writing, and uh, I'm, I'm a big fan, and I'm glad I subscribed. Thank you for subscribing, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, for Super Producer Jason, I'm Paul. I'm Aaron. And we just had an interview with Shang Peng. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next week. Next week. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this episode, check out our other content, especially interviews. You can interact with us directly through social media at The Fin Factor and on Instagram at Fin Factor. And don't forget to join our live streams on YouTube. Visit our website at thefinfactor.com where you'll find all of our episodes as videos or podcasts. You'll also find our exclusive merchandise to help support our show.